Good morning. Good morning. Yes, that's a good good morning. Hey, we are going to continue our series known as Acts, the Actions of the Apostles by the Holy Spirit. Today, as Laura read perfectly, may I add, we, we see an apostle preach the gospel to a Gentile household and friends of this Gentile household for the very first time in history, these Gentiles are, being, are hearing the gospel specifically from an apostle. And it's exciting to know as we begin this sermon today, as we're going to go through a bunch of verses, but I promise it will not be as long as maybe some of you think it's going to be, that this opportunity that they had actually made it so we today could hear the gospel ourselves and hear it, be able to turn from our sin and be redeemed by the God most high. Last week, we studied how God had told Cornelius, a very religious man who was in the military for the Roman Empire, he told God, specifically spoke to Cornelius in a vision and said, go find a guy named Peter, and he'll tell you about who I really am. Peter, around the same time, had had his own vision. While he was pretty hungry, he fell into a trance, and God showed him what, it, what looked like a sheet coming down from heaven by the four corners of it was being held and a bunch of different type of animals that Peter had been taught were unclean animals were on the sheet and he had been told by God in this vision to get up, kill and eat these animals as an example that the law was not something that Peter should attempt to justify himself by anymore, nor should he expect that, that from the people that he would preach the gospel to that were Gentiles. And now after being sh shown and told this by God three different times, Luke tells us, Peter then, according to Luke, understood. Today, we are going to study a heavenly appointed conversation. Have you ever had one of these where you were just like, man, things just lined up in such a way so I could tell someone about Jesus? The closest that I've ever had when it came to an experience like this was years ago, I was on a mission trip and we went down to LA because they all need Jesus, amen? Rams fans, come on. And so, I, uh, so we went down to Skid Row actually, and it was a youth group and myself, and we went down to Skid Row and we started to share our faith with different people that were homeless. And one of the things that I noticed about the people in that context was they had heard the gospel a lot. They had heard it from a bunch of different people. They had experienced people coming and telling them about Jesus. And they had one of the coolest outreach events I've ever been a part of. It was called, uh, it was called Skid Row Karaoke. All right. And so we went to this building where there were a bunch of uh, people who did not have homes and there were a bunch of youth and there were some college kids and we were all there and we were doing karaoke and we were singing different songs. And I remember there was this guy, his name was Ron and Ron saw me and I started to talk to him and then I kind of left him alone. And then some of the youth that I had brought started to talk to Ron. And Ron had all of these kind of argumentative questions, like, well, how could you believe in God if God allows bad things to happen? And he was saying things like this. And then I remember these two young, like, freshmen in high school, they walk over to me and they're like, Tim, he's asking us tough questions and we don't know how to respond. Will you go talk to him? And I was like, yeah, all right. And so I walked over to Ron and, and I was kind of like, hey, Ron, where are you from? And I started to ask him questions about him. And he started to tell me things and everything. And so I used about 10 minutes of asking him questions and never did I broach the subject of the gospel or anything like that. And so after about 10 minutes, I said, hey, Ron, I have to go sing Ice Ice Baby. So uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for telling me your story. And I got up and left. And then I realized that Ron was kind of annoyed that I didn't tell him about the gospel. And so he started to kind of like follow me. And so I ran into these two other missionaries, college kids who were there to share with the people that were there about Christ. And I said, hey, do you see that guy, Ron? Yeah, I want you to pray for him because tonight I'm pretty sure he's frustrated that I didn't tell him the gospel. And so I just kind of, I sang an ice ice baby. It was legit. I, here's the video. I'm just kidding. And so, uh, <laughs> and so uh, it's not on YouTube, um, I hope. And so... So then I just started to talk to some other people and everything. And then towards the end of the night, I was sitting in the back and Ron kind of comes over, kind of, kind of like just walks over and he's like, Hey Tim. I was like, Hey Ron. He's like, Hey, so, uh, you know, I told you my story and I heard a little bit about your story, but like, you know, I, I was kind of wondering if, you know, like, like why you're here. And I was like, Oh, we're here because I'm on a mission trip and, da -da -da, and I didn't share the gospel. And he was straight up annoyed. He's like, Hey, 
hey, would you tell me the gospel already? And I said, well, Ron, the thing is, I don't think you want to hear it. And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, I think you hear it, you've heard it from a ton of different people and you're just not interested in hearing it. And he goes, well, I'd kind of like to hear the way you'd share it. And so I got to share the gospel with Ron. And I'd love to say we then baptized him in a fountain and then now he's, he's in the back right now. He's not. Um, but that was probably one of the more heavenly appointed conversations. And what I'm not saying is you shouldn't just share with people. What I'm saying is for some reason, I just kind of felt this need to not bombard him with it. And I got to just kind of talk to him throughout the night. And then I got to share with him. And I remember what he said, which I really appreciated. He said, I've heard that a thousand times but I've never heard it the way you just described it. And I think really the thing that uh, we've been doing in Compelled, the training that we've been doing has been we've emphasized the resurrection because the resurrection changes everything. And so I got to talk with him about that. And for me, that was the closest I've ever experienced of just God kind of setting the stage and making it so unbelievably easy, if you will, to share the gospel. Today, we're continuing in this passage where we will see God directing those in service to Cornelius this military man for the Roman Empire, to find Peter and invite him back to speak with Cornelius and his family. So let's start in verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of this vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. Verse 18, they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? This interaction and gospel conversation that will take place between Peter and this Gentile household eventually is very important as the Holy Spirit is directing two different types of people, one an apostles, apostle of the Lord's, and the other, a Roman army centurion, to meet together to talk about something that will ultimately change the eternal trajectory of Cornelius, his family, and many upon many Gentiles, including us, in the future. Verse 22, the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The men sent by Cornelius explained that in their minds, I'm guessing they were justifying Cornelius to Peter so that he would then talk to Cornelius. They explained how an angel had talked to him and told him to send for Peter so that Peter could fill in the blanks of what the centurion did not understand about God. Verse 23, second part. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Talk about an eternal appointment. God had orchestrated such a beautiful Bible study for many who were yet to know Jesus to hear about and be introduced to him through Peter. Verse 25. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. He said, stand up. I'm only a man myself. All right, now we're going to get to preaching. Cornelius went into Peter's home, showed uh, great, or uh, when Peter entered into Cornelius's home, Cornelius showed great reverence to Peter by bowing down, which was something that was acceptable and expected within the military ranks of the Roman Empire But Peter, knowing that the Lord, who is the only one who is due of this true reverence and worship, he told Cornelius, stand up, because Peter knew that he did not deserve worship. Now, reverence and respect for individuals is a very good thing. It's a humble thing to respect your elders, those in authority and responsibility over you, those who serve you. To respect individuals who work hard and care for others is not a bad thing at all. But to give reverence which veers into worship of someone or something created rather than the creator, that's where mankind tends to get it twisted. Now, we live in a celebrity culture, uh, celebrity worship culture, don't we? 
We want to know everything that someone that we like is doing. We want to know what they ate for breakfast. We want to know what their Starbucks order is. We want to know what they recommend. We want to use the same shampoo that they use in the assumption that somehow that'll make us closer to them or we'll be more like the celebrity. Now, it's kind of weird if you step back and kind of watch it from the outside looking in. And, and just for the record, I'm a huge fan of Steph Curry, all right? So I'm just calling out what I do as well. All right, this is just the thing. I forgot to wear my curry shoes, but I have some. And the underlying problem with mankind is that we prefer to worship something we can see and perhaps touch rather than someone who by faith calls us to himself. Now, Billy Graham once said, God is like the wind. You cannot see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind, which is true. I can see the effects of God, honestly, in many of you that I know in this room. As you pursue him, as you experience more life change, more spiritual growth, more understanding of things spiritually that you once didn't understand. So Peter says, stand up. I am only a man myself. Peter is not an OG Pope. You know what I'm saying? Some would like to treat him that way, but he is not the original gangster pope. Peter is just a man used by God. He is no more important than a hammer to the building of a house. He is useful, but it is the carpenter that is essential. And Peter, like us, are tools for the Lord. But the Lord is the one who is due worship. The tools in which he chooses to use is us. If you grew up in the church, depending on the type of tradition you were in, the pastor might have been exalted as a godly figure that is above all else. Uh, Yeah, we don't hold to that tradition. My job as lead pastor is to be a servant and shepherd to those who God draws to his church because it's his church, not mine. And I'm not above my master in any way, shape, or form. I don't know that my motivations have always been this way. I've said many a times that in the past, I would make much of Jesus, people would make much of me, and I liked it. So even as I say this, I know that in the past, my motivations have been impure, and so there's a possibility they're still impure now, even if I don't know it. But I serve this church. I pray for this church. And it's not the building, guys. 400 North Winchester doesn't mean anything. You mean something. Okay, I serve this church, I pray for this church, I teach and care for this church. Let's be honest, I put up with this church sometimes, all right? Because God has given me that responsibility. And I wanna point all the glory, I wanna point all the praise, and I wanna point all the thankfulness back to him. But I can look back not that far long ago and see times and situations where I wanted credit where I wanted reverence, where I might not have said this out loud, but I acted this way, I wanted worship. And Peter in this passage reminds me, stand up, I am just a man. I'm a tool. I'm just a tool, guys. My ex-girlfriend from high school was right. I'm a tool. (laughs) So if you feel loved by this church, if you feel cared for by this community of believers, if you feel led and served by me or the other staff or the elders, Give credit where credit is due. It's to the Lord God Almighty who gave us his spirit to do any of the things that we do for him in the first place. Verse 27, while talking with him, Cornelius, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter is being put in a place that I think any of us ought to be envious of. They want to know what Peter knows that they don't know. God has orchestrated. He has ordained this meeting of an apostle with a bunch of Gentiles, a bunch of non-Jews, and it was going to be the opportunity for God to begin to draw an entirely different people to become one people, to become God's people. Not because of birthright or because of their bloodline, but because of Jesus' shed blood, his grace, and his resurrection. But doesn't that kind of sound like he's justifying himself? If you kind of read it, we can't hear tone, but just kind of read it like, doesn't it kind of sound like, you know, I'm not supposed to fraternize with you Gentiles, but God said it was okay. Thurston Howell, the third voice, lovey, right? No, no one knows Gilligan's Island? That's fine. That's not what's happening here. 
Peter is making known that God has made known to him that Gentiles too are being included in God's people. This is huge because this means that the gospel truly is for any and everyone. The message of the gospel sets free our need to attempt to earn or justify ourselves. And that's a huge struggle. And now Peter can preach and teach this good news to any and everyone knowing that God will save some. Verse 29. So when I was sent for, Peter says, I came without raising any objection. But may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius responded three days ago. I was in my house praying at this very hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. Real quick, could you imagine if, if like, like uh, the guys that, that uh, Cornelius sent got it wrong and they got Simon the Tanner instead of Peter? And then he's like, I have no idea why I'm here, right? Like that, okay, sorry. I just thought that was funny. Okay, so I sent for you immediately, verse 33, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God. Wow to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Wow. Because God made clear to Peter that he could and should associate with Gentiles. He came at once, and when Cornelius sent for him, was wondering for the purpose of his visit. That's why he was there, but he still wasn't sure why he was there. And that's a fair question. And an even better answer from Cornelius, now we are all here to listen to what the Lord has commanded you to tell us. What an opportunity. What a sweet moment the Lord is giving both Peter to share and Cornelius and those he invited to hear about the good news that they can actually know God, that they want to worship, and his name is Jesus. Oh, this is sweet. And I guess my question for you, if you're in this place, if you follow Jesus, if you identify with Christ's life, death, and resurrection, is this. Do you look for opportunities like this? Do we pray for opportunities like this? Do we dream about chances to share with a group of people the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, every year, barring uh, a a few years back because of COVID, we spend certain holidays with my wife's extended family down in Orange County. Now, this is usually pretty social. We go to restaurants and we're like, party of 26. And for once, it's a big party, not just because of the Rileys. We play card games. We eat food, we talk about eating food. While eating food, we plan and reminisce about family vacations and eating food. And usually, before we have a large meal at someone's home, we pray for the food. Now, not everyone in our family is identified as a Christian, and yet Christianity has always been something that I think the majority of people in the family has identified as. We identify with Jesus' sacrifice, a lot of the people in the family attend church, They serve in their churches, and they worship Jesus to some extent. So usually around these meals, when prayer is expected, at least for the past many years, I've been asked to be the one that prays. Now, I'm a pastor, so maybe it's assumed that my prayers are louder than others. King Jesus! No, that's not how I pray. But you better believe I always use that as an opportunity to give thanks to God for his redemption that is found only in Jesus' life, his death and resurrection and exaltation. I thank God for grace, which is given to anyone who would receive it by faith and find their identity in Jesus. And in less than one minute, because I'm not like, you know, seven minute prayer for food because everyone would be like, bro, it's getting cold. I try to clearly proclaim in thankfulness to God his saving grace because I assume that many of the people in that room don't really think about God and his love unless things are difficult and dire. Peter is being put in a place not only where people are stationary to hear, but based on God's grace are prepared and even wanting to hear the good news about the God that they worship but they do not know. This is probably more normal than we realize There are people in our lives that want to hear about the hope that we have, but often they are quieted or ignored because some don't want to hear about it, and we hear more from them and their arguments against organized religion, and they're deafening, and so we don't think there are people in our lives that want to hear about the good news that we understand. Now, as we said in Compelled this past week, we don't convert anyone. We testify to what God has done. 
And people can do with that what they like. Our job is to be willing and share when prompted, either through being asked or seeing God open a door. But the results, church, are not up to us. And I hope if you are a Christian and you've been following Jesus and you want to talk about Jesus to other people, that it is freeing to know that you don't convert and the results are not up to you. So share, Christians, when you feel confident. Share even when you're a bit nervous, but share. Because you're sharing good news and the results and the understanding of that news is not your responsibility. You are responsible for being willing to be used. That is your responsibility. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. What a transformation Peter has experienced. Now understanding that God does not show favoritism. He loves mankind. He loves people of all ages and genders and races and dialects and backgrounds. And God doesn't expect one type of person to come to him but he offers grace to people who understand that they are in need of grace. There's a wonderful story about a Chicago bank that once asked for a letter of recommendation on a young Bostonian being considered for employment. The Boston Investment House could not say enough about the young man. His father, they wrote, was a Cabot. His mother was a Lowell. Further back was a happy blend of Salton Stalls, Peabody's, and others of Boston's first families. His recommendation was given without hesitation. Several days later, the Chicago bank sent a note saying the information that they supplied was altogether inadequate. It read, we are not contemplating using the young man for breeding purposes, just for work, And neither is God impressed by your background or your family tree, but accepts those from every family, every nation, and every race who would fear and work and serve the king. Have you ever thought that there are people in your life around you that God couldn't save? Like, it would never happen. Like, oh, that person would never become a Christian. I hear that all the time, and I think that people think that because they never really base it on the reality of how good God is. They base it on that person's sin and they base it on that person's pride. But God is the initiator and it isn't based on the person's potential to be useful, but based on God's grace and mercy to save some. So maybe when I said that you thought of someone, start praying for the opportunity to share with them the grace of God. Understanding grace It means that we fear, that we have reverence, that we do not come to God flippantly, but with the understanding of his godness and his glory and his power. And it is a byproduct of being God's possession to fear him. Not that we fear him and then earn the right to come to him, which is the same with when Peter was saying, doing what is right. This isn't the idea of doing what is right gains you the kingdom. That's religion. That's not the gospel. But those in the kingdom do what is right in the eyes of the Lord, things that require faith in him. Because we are his and we act like his. Not we act like his and because of that we earn the right to become his. When we are God's possession, we tend to act like it. Not perfectly, but progressively. And that is something that I yearn for in my own personal Christian life. Not to be holier than thou or judgmental, but repentant and gracious because God has been so gracious to me. Verse 36, Peter, while speaking to this group of people, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Peter continues letting these Gentiles know that at first God brought the message of the gospel to the people of Israel, both through the Old Testament that foreshadowed of the coming of a better king who would reign over the kingdom of God, and then Jesus' earthly ministry in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit arriving at Pentecost. All of that shows that Paul mean, it shows what Paul meant when he writes to the church in Rome in Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. 
And God's plan was always to bring the good news to every type of people. But he began with Israel as an example of his people and as an example of the human condition of rebellion. And for a Jew who had been raised through the belief that they could keep the law or when they admitted that they failed, they could offer a sacrifice, not understanding that both of those actions were not to justify themselves, but to foreshadow and point to the true justifier in Jesus Christ who did keep the law perfectly and yet sinless sacrifices himself for sinners like us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness in the scriptures, just so you know, is used two different ways in the New Testament. Righteousness means right standing. Another way of seeing it is justification or our salvation. And sometimes it's a way of expressing our obedience to the Lord. But in order for our obedience to actually be real righteousness, we first must be found righteous before God through God's gift of grace. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Peter goes on in his explanation to Cornelius and his family and friends, and he says in verse 37, You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Peter is setting the stage for how even Gentiles in Caesarea had heard about what Jesus of Nazareth was doing. He was doing the supernatural, not out of trickery like all the other false messiahs who had come and gone, but was doing this with God specifically being with him. Verse 39, we are all witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. Peter in a house full of people who wanted to hear what had happened and what God wanted them to know testifies to what Peter knows to be true, what he knows to have happened, what he saw with his own eyes, that Jesus was put to death, that he was resurrected, and he was seen by many as evidence that he had victoriously resurrected from the dead. Verse 41, he was not seen by all the people but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Peter is making it known that he is an eyewitness and the other apostles specifically that were chosen by God to be eyewitnesses and bold proclaimers were sent by God who weren't wishfully thinking that their proclamation of good news could be true, but that they were personally affected and experienced the resurrected Jesus. They ate and drank with him. They didn't just see him in passing, they experienced him. They were in each other's quarantine bubble. You know what I'm saying? Verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. He commanded them, the apostles, to preach and to testify to what Jesus had done, what he had spoken about in generations past by the prophets. And this was God's plan all along. And Jesus was the fulfillment of what God said years before. And the end result is that everyone who by faith trusts Jesus to be enough to set them free receives forgiveness for their sins in Jesus' name. Wow, that's good news. It's not our earning, it's not our potential, it's not our manners or our accolades. The only thing that matters is what did we do with Jesus? So church, wherever you're at this morning, I want to pose this question again. What have you done with Jesus? Is he a get out of hell free card? He's not. See a spiritual booty call that you only call when you're feeling low and desperate? Is that too far? (laughs) Just remember my email, Mike at, anyway. So what have and are you doing with Jesus? Because he is more than an insurance policy that you pull out when there is a need. 
He is a God with skin, and we were created to follow and worship and exalt his name with our lives. And that happens as we exercise what he tells us to do. That happens as we love others as Christ first loved us. That happens as we get to know him better through the reading and dialoguing and applying of his word. And the benefit, the byproduct, is a life that begins to have more evidence of the fruit of the spirit. Are you kidding me? Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What is better as a human to be able to increase in these things? I want to increase in my love and my joy and my peace and my patience and my kindness and my goodness and my faithfulness and my gentleness and my self-control. You know who has all of those traits? Jesus. And I want to look like him. I want Christ's likeness. And that doesn't come from wishing it would happen. It comes from loving God and demonstrated by obeying him and his word. And the byproduct of our salvation is that we pursue him and Christ's likeness is then given to us over time. I'm in. Take my life, Lord. Take my soul. Take my identity. It's all yours. And you know what he does? He gives them back to me so I now can live for him. Jesus, you're legit. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard this message. Now, a few things here. This doesn't mean that any and everyone who ever hears the gospel believes. Many aren't interested or really willing to think through what the gospel means. They have excuses, or I mean questions, that they tend to hide behind. Now, this past week on Wednesday night, we've been teaching an evangelism training called Compelled, which I used to teach all the time, except it really, other than this week, has looked nothing like the past Compelled that I've taught. So if you did it in the past, you missed out because there is new stuff. And this past week, I taught specifically on why Christians believe what they believe. Why Christians believe what they believe. Where I walked through specifically the, res- the evidence of the resurrection historically, What I know that scholars, even skeptical non-Christian scholars, agree upon when it comes to the first century history surrounding the supposed resurrection of Jesus Christ. I taught 13 things that are agreed upon so much that they are considered facts that on their own are not supernatural and honestly, they're easily believable, while also giving about eight arguments that most skeptics use to attempt to disprove the resurrection. But based on the 13 facts, the arguments seem pretty ludicrous. And at least for me, the arguments would actually require more faith to believe that he didn't rise from the dead than to believe that he did. Now, if you heard that teaching, uh, this is participatory, okay? If you heard that teaching on Wednesday, if you were here this past Wednesday and you heard the 13 facts and the eight arguments, here's what, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything in service except for this one thing. Would you just stand up? If you were here and you heard that, would you just stand up, please? Thank you, guys. Thank you. A decent amount of you. Look at these people. These are legit, wonderful people. Now, stay standing just for a moment. If anyone else is interested in these facts and why the resurrection is absolutely historical and logical, ask one of these people standing up. Because the compelled training has been preparing them to be prepared to share with you the reason for the hope that they have. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. Now, in this context, where Peter is getting to preach in this heavenly appointed home Bible study, Peter had preached to a lot of willing souls that God had been drawing to himself, and he sent the Holy Spirit to indwell all of those who were hearing the message of the gospel. This is how I should pray. I should pray that when myself or anyone on the teaching team that comes up here and opens God's word, that God would give everyone the ears to hear and want to repent of their sins and turn to God, not because of how well we proclaim it, but because of how great the gospel personified Jesus really is. Verse 45, the circumcised believers, the Jews, who had become believers, who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out 
even on two Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Now, this is a new thing. This is different than any of the Jewish believers had expected. These Gentiles, these non-Jews had heard the same gospel that God had delivered to each one of them through the apostles, and they too were being saved by God, and salvation was at hand. The Holy Spirit had descended, and to identify their salvation that was the same as the Jews' salvation, they too spoke in tongues. Now, this speaking in tongues, most agree, is the same speaking in tongues that was addressed at Pentecost when we read Acts 2. Let me uh, remind you of what we read in Acts 2 many months ago. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like, simile language, like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled, word means dominated, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse five. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in their own native language? Now, this was not a prayer language that we're reading in Acts 10. This is not gibberish. This was known languages that were upon the earth being uttered by people who did not speak the languages that they were communicating. And what were they communicating? The text says, praise for God. They weren't speaking in other languages to preach the gospel or giving some extra biblical word they were praising God supernaturally in languages that they had not been taught as confirmation that their salvation, these Gentiles, these first Gentiles that God had saved were in fact included into God's people. Both Jew and Gentile offered the same salvation in the name of Jesus. This is such a big deal. Verse 46, second part. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Peter recognized that this conversation, this home Bible study, the people in attendance and the message that was proclaimed was all for the glory of God rescuing messed up people which our sin condition does not discriminate between Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, Southpaw, Yankee, Kardashian. We all need Jesus Christ. And it is through him alone that we are found righteous. So what reason would there to be for them not to be baptized? None. The Gentile also should identify with the life and death and resurrection of Jesus through the symbol of baptism. So let me, let me just say this. If you're in this place and you believe in Jesus Christ, if you say, yes, he lived, he died, he rose again, and I trust that as my sole means of salvation, and you haven't been baptized, why not? I recommend that you reach out. I recommend you fill out a card and you drop it in the box as you leave. You reach out to me. But please look into baptism. If you were baptized before you actually made a commitment to follow Jesus, and this happens a lot, you may have done the act of water touching your body, but it wasn't baptism. Baptism symbolizes dying to your old self and being raised into your new life. And without a commitment or intention to follow Jesus, you just kind of took a bath or a shower in front of people. So while baptism doesn't save you, I'd encourage you to talk with us about it because it is an opportunity for you to begin to obey the commands of God. So then Luke documents that the new brothers and sisters in the faith invited Peter to stay with him for a few days. This is a wonderful example of God's saving nature, his ability to put the right people in the right place at the right time, that he draws people to himself, not based on the individual's goodness, but based on God's grace. And I hope that we as a church see more and more the beauty of his grace demonstrated in his life, his death, and his resurrection as our sole means of righteousness, unearned but given in Jesus Christ's name. Laura, Eugene, would you guys come on up? In the Antarctic summer of 1908, 
Sir Ernest Shackleton and three companions attempted to travel to the South Pole from their, uh, where they were staying. They set off with four ponies to help carry the load. Weeks later, their ponies were dead, all their rations were exhausted, and they turned back towards their base. Their goal was not accomplished. Altogether, they trekked for 127 days. On the return journey, as Shackleton records, in the heart of the Antarctic, a book that he wrote, the time was spent talking about food. Elaborate feasts, gourmet delights, sumptuous menus. As they staggered along, suffering from dysentery, not knowing whether they would survive, every waking hour was occupied with thoughts of eating. Jesus, who also knew the ravages of food deprivation, said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We can understand Shackleton's obsession with food, which offers a glimpse of the passion Jesus intends for our quest for righteousness. May we, as a church, live and thirst for Jesus, his gift of righteousness, his right standing, which he has given to us. And if we have already received right standing before God, may we continue to hunger for it. May we continue to be reminded of it, to tell others about it, because he who knew no sin became sin so that we could have the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I just thank you, God. You are good. And I hope that the understanding that our salvation, our justification, our right standing before you is a gift. I pray, God, that we would give you praise for that. I pray even as we sing in just a moment that we would be reminded of how amazing it is to be yours. God, wherever there was conviction in this passage, Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith to put it into practice and that you would use us for your glory and we would see more Christ-likeness. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.